The Unforgiven Lion L. Johnson, Primarch of the Dark Angels, demigod and gene sire to the chapters of The Unforgiven, is amongst the greatest of humanity's warriors. His manner is stoic and taciturn. His martial skill is exceeded only by his loyalty to the Emperor of Mankind and the singular devotion to duty which L. Johnson displays. It is from Lion L. Johnson that the Dark Angels learnt the somber and secretive ways they have practiced now for ten thousand years. From him stems their adoption of monastic trappings, an archaic ritual. Yet for all the distrust engendered in certain quarters of the Imperium by their closed mouth ways, for all the secrets they hide within the innermost circles of their chapter, the Dark Angels are as faithful and formidable a brotherhood as has ever fought for the Imperium of Man. They sweep into battle beneath fluttering banners, eyes bright within the shadows of their cowls, blades sharp in their hands, rare and ancient weaponry they unleash upon their foes, painstakingly maintained since the Imperium's earliest days. Specialist formations and warrior lords lead their onslaught. The bone-armored veterans of the Deathwing, the swift huntsmen of the Ravenwing, Merciless interrogator chaplains and cold-eyed librarians who can reach into their victims' minds and rip out their innermost thoughts and fears. Few can stand long against such implacable foes, and none are permitted to obstruct their hidden agendas. Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, your faithful servant and I wish to introduce you to the forces, factions, and faces of the Warhammer 40k universe, the grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace, there is only time for war. And today, we shall be taking a look at the newest lore update coming from the Dark Angels 10th edition codex, for much has changed. And yet, as the old axiom goes, the more things change the more they stay the same. Now I do recall my Dark Angels video, links in the description, this one of course, and I did make some quite apocalyptic prognostications, as I am wont to do. But how much of what I thought has actually come to pass? For I had presumed that when Lionel Johnson returned, well, that he would be the personification of the Emperor's wrath. Yet, is this the case? Or has something far more subtle occurred? So, let us now delve into the new lore and find out. There will be direct quotes from the official track, so you can always be assured that you know as much as I do, and are not dazzled with fun but inaccurate details. I will clearly mark my own thoughts and interpretations to be outside of these. And so, as usual, let us lean on existing wisdom and existing tales. Time for a story. To quote. Valhallen Captain Jan Sudvarkar stood with his command squad atop a prefab ferrocreed rampart. The wall stretched across the high Cyclopea Pass from one rocky mountainside to the other. Lining its fire step to either side of Sudvakar, or dug into foxholes hastily blasted from rock and snow before the wall, were the captain's forces, the 118th Valhallen Infantry, some 442nd Krovian scourges, ragged mobs of local defense militia. They were all that had been salvaged during the retreat from Aesmola. Sudvakar had done what he could to weld them into a coherent army. So high above sea level, the temperature was brutally cold, and rebreathers were standard issue, at least in so far as the supply of them stretched. Hypoxia and cold blight were constant perils, and both had gnawed at Suvakar's ranks over the past few days. Neither concerned him now, however. The captain's attention 
was instead focused down the mountain path. Down there, a heretic horde approached. Sudvakar felt hatred and fear churn in his gut as he watched the foe draw closer. The sunlit purity of the snows and the deep blue vaults of the heavens so near above only served to exaggerate the traitor's incongruous foulness. Mags, he barked, holding out one gloved hand to his adjutant, Lethig, taking the preferred set of bulky magnoculars. The captain studied the approaching enemy in detail. Cult of whispering truth, he growled, recognizing on robes, banners, and tank hulls the sigil now so reviled from the ruins of Esmola to the Cudhole Reach. I see Gosbord light infantry and Narmath armoured amidst their ranks. Traitors vermin, spat Sudvakar's vox officer, Tyrem. The captain's reply died in his throat as he panned the magnoculars over the horde's front ranks and saw the giants advancing there. Son of the Emperor, Sudvakar whispered. I see heretic Astartes, and the hooded king leads them. His command squad breathed oaths. The captain stared at a beast in black power armor who had so bedeviled their world. Its face was lost in the shadows of its deep cowl, but there was no mistaking the barbed and glowing blade in its fist, or the fan of bone spines that rose from its shoulder guards. Here was a heretical warlord who had turned once loyal imperial servants into murderous lunatics, had plunged millions into civil war, and unleashed the heretic Astartes upon those who defied him. It was all Sudvakar could do not to turn and run. Tyrim, signal the gun crews. Enemy will pass our range markers in under a minute, he ordered, fighting to keep the tremor from his voice. Then spread the word. We stand and fight here. These dogs shall not pass. His subordinates began transmitting his orders. Sudvakar, meanwhile, steeled himself. Their chances of defeating this enemy were virtually nil. Still, he would bleed these traitors, Sudvakar promised himself. By the God Emperor, he would do that at least. His artillery began to sing their hymn of war, and the battle began in earnest. Barely thirty minutes later, Captain Sudvakar knew the defeat was inevitable. His soldiers had piled heretic corpses all the way up the pass and made a virtual second rampart of them before their wall. Yet that wall was breached in three places. Lengths of it were ablaze with a supernatural flame that could not be quenched. The foxholes had become open graves. The field guns had been brutally silenced by counter-battery fire from heretic tanks. Barely half Sudvakar's soldiers still lived while the heretic seething before the wall felt numberless. Worst, barely fifty yards from the imperial line, the hooded king and his heretic Astartes elite advanced unhurriedly, firing as they came. It seemed the heretic warlord meant to scale the wall in person. When he did, Sudvakar knew it would be over. Sir, you must hear this! Tarim grabbed his arm, thrust his Vox headset at him. His eyes were feverish bright, though Sudvakar couldn't tell if it was fear or some other emotion that gripped him. He lifted the headset to one ear. The voice that crackled from it was inhumanly deep and powerful. Its words clipped. Militarum forces, hold position. We draw nigh. The Emperor protects. Before Sudvakar could respond to the transmission, a cry went up further down the line. Soldiers shouted oaths and pointed to the northern slopes of the pass. To his amazement, Sudvakar saw more than a score of huge black armored figures on rugged combat bikes tearing down the steep slope towards the traitor's flank. The captain knew in his bones that no unaugmented human could possibly accomplish such a feat of riding. But these, he realized, were no mere humans. Thrown to your mighty guard, Emperor! The Space Marines! he shouted, as the bikers opened fire and the thunder of bolt weapons rolled through the pass. 
The angels of the Emperor are come. A glance at the hooded king showed that he too had spotted the newcomers. To Sudvakar's shock, and by their reaction, to the shock of the king's subjects also, the hulking warrior was backing away from the onrushing bikers. He shook his head slowly, as though in denial. Thrusters howled. Sudvakar staggered and his snow cap was blown from his head by downdraft as a trio of black aircraft streaked low and fast over the wall. Two strafed the heretic lines, howling traitors vanished amid skies as of bloody snow. The third craft dropped some manner of bulky projectile directly onto the hooded king from what looked to Sudvakar suicidally close range. The captain recoiled, expecting an explosion. Instead, a rippling energy field expanded from the point of impact to engulf the king and more than half his heretic Astartes elite. Sudvakar blinked in amazement as he saw the hulking traitors frozen in place as though trapped by the cessation of time itself. Before Sudvakar could catch up to the speed of events, another wave of black-hulled attack craft screamed in from the south. These were anti-grav speeders, several squadrons of them sweeping around the mountain's flank and descending on the heretics with cannons blazing. Plasma blasts and storms of shells tore apart mobs of cultists and traitor soldiery. The surviving heretic Astartes returned fire and sent several speeders sprawling down to explode amidst the rocks. Yet, as the bikers cut deeper into the horde from the north and the speeders and attack craft doubled back for fresh attack runs, the heretic casualties mounted and her advance wavered. All platoons, fire at will! barked Suvakar into the Vox headset he still clutched. Support the Space Marines! He led by example, blazing away with his last pistol as a paralysis of amazement left him at last. As the Astro Militarum rained fire upon their foes, more angels of the Emperor joined the fight. As the bikers raced through the heart of the Horde, so blinding energy spheres expanded in their wake. These eye-watering teleport blooms dissipated to leave behind bands of gigantically armored warriors in bone-white armor. Some bore huge blades and shields, some were armed with colossal firearms. All unleashed death upon the traitor ranks with such sudden and vengeful fury that even the loyal Imperial Guardsmen recoiled in fear. Shrieking missiles and soaring lines of fire reduced tanks to blazing wrecks and traitors to chopped meat and blackened corpses. As Sudvakar watched, wrestling with sheer sensory overload, the space marines in black armor and those in bone tore the heart from the traitor horde. The heretic Astartes attempted a counter-charge, but they were too few and caught badly out of position. They took their toll upon the loyalist space marines, but not one heretic lived to capitalize upon their gains. When Sudvakar thought he could not be amazed further, a trio of huge gunships streaked down from the cobalt skies. Their hulls were a deep forest green and bore winged blade insignia. They fired as they came, pulverizing and scattering the reeling heretics. Then, with blistering speed, they were directly overhead and dropping into the pass on howling thrusters. A storm of smoke and whipped up snow battered the Astro Militarum soldiers atop their wall. Sudvakar was half blinded. Gripping the battlements to steady himself, he saw through slitted eyes the suggestion of the vessels touching down, of their assault ramps dropping, and of warriors in dark green armor spilling out. Bolt weapons blazed amidst the whirling clouds, chain blades howled. Then, as swiftly as they had arrived, the loyalists fell back into their vessels accompanied by the bone armored giants. The gunships rose on columns of fire, point defense guns still blazing, then accelerated away with the leonine roar of ramjets. Through the settling snow, Sudvakar saw that the remaining bikers and skimmers were sweeping away down the pass without another word of the Vox. He let out a rattling breath and checked his chrono. The engagement had lasted less than five minutes. Cultists and traitor guardsmen staggered from hiding places or milled in confusion before the wall. As they did, Sudvakar saw the chance that the space marines had handed him. 
They had clearly come with their own mission, yet the carnage they had wrought amongst the foe had turned this engagement decisively into loyalist favour. Sudvika knew his duty and that of his soldiers, and thanked the god Emperor that the Adeptus Astartes had given him the means to see it done. All forces! Ready arms and prepare to advance! he roared, filled with renewed hope and fury. Butcher these traitors, and drive them before you like the storm! We shall not squander the opportunity given us by the angels of death. We shall make them proud. End quote. The Primarch of the Dark Angels hath returned. I have covered these details in the Arcs of Omen entry, The Lion. Yet, for a self-contained experience, let us hear the synopsis from the creators themselves. To quote. Millennium 41. Closing Days. The Shadowed Path. It was in the era Indomitus, as the galaxy shook to the howl of warp storms and the clamor of crusading armies, that the Lion knew consciousness again as he walked the shadow paths of a strange supernatural forest. How he came to be there, who had spirited him from his hidden place of millennia-long repose, was a mystery. He knew only his wounds had healed, and that he felt his loyalty to the Emperor blaze bright as ever. By this star did he navigate the paths of the sinister forest beyond the bounds of reality. With each supernatural beast battled and bested, each revelation experienced, the Lion regained his memories and forged his path. Soon enough, he became the questing lord of this mist-wreathed forest, so akin to an echo of Caliban of old. As he strode the winding ways of the shadowed forest, the Lion earned by his deeds the gift of the Emperor's shield to bear into battle. As he began to cross the veil and set foot once again upon the worlds of the tormented Imperium, so he recovered a masterwork blade of Kamarth and named it Fealty. While the lion prowled on the hunt, he saw the cataclysmic decline that afflicted his father's realm. Vengeful, he struck down the abominations of the Dark Gods where he found them. World by world and whisper by whisper, the legends of the Night of the Nihilus began to grow, and they were redolent with both fear and and hope. His powers were stored, and greater, or at least stranger, than they had ever been, his eyes opened to the reality he had woken to. The lion sought the fallen, yet his quest was not the same as his gene son's hunt. The lion was possessed of an absolute conviction that some of those who had followed Luther into rebellion, but had never embraced worship of the dark gods, might still be truly redeemed. This would not be the absolution of death in confession, but a second chance to fight for the Lion and the Emperor. He found, judged, and forgave one such risen battle brother after another, while offering the final mercy of his blade to those beyond his power to save. It is while engaged in this quest that the Lion was located by Commander Dante of the Blood Angels, who bore a warning of the terrible peril facing the unforgiven in the idolatrous system at the hands of Vashtor the Archiphane. By the time the Lion reached the idolatrous system, the unforgiven chapters had committed to battle upon the nightmarish demon world they found there. They were led to war by Azrael and the Dark Angels themselves. Their primary assault had been furious, even reckless, for it was motivated by terrible spiritual shock. The infernal world, Wormwood, that Vashtor the Archivane had brought into being was unmistakably a mocking reincarnation of Caliban. Leaving the Blood Angels to join the fight, El Johnson and his Risen stepped into the paths of the forest and made for the planet's nightmarish surface. As battle raged on Wormwood, Lionel Johnson met the demon Primarch Angron in mortal combat. The lion goaded the Red Angel and led him away from the outnumbered and outflanked Unforgiven. 
this in turn afforded Azrael, Dante, and the assembled Risen the opportunity to coordinate the fight back against Abaddon and Vashtor's forces. Though many lives were lost, the Dark Angels and their allies fought their way clear of the trap before the planet vanished through reality's veil, while the Lion, after a long and grueling duel, successfully banished Angron. End quote. But what changes has the return of their sire wrought throughout the Imperium, or at the very least, amongst the Unforgiven? Do not worry. I shall indeed be putting my own oar in very soon, but let us hear what the Lion is actually up to, and how things have changed. To quote, For thousands of years, it has been the fate of captured Fallen to be taken back to the Rock, or in the case of those apprehended by successor chapters, to the darkest cells within their fortress monasteries or flagships, and there excruciated by the interrogated chaplains. Such questioning always ended in death, whether in slow agony for those who would not repent, or after being granted the swift release of final redemption. Since Lionel Johnson returned to lead the Unforgiven, however, there have been slight and at times enigmatic changes. The Fallen are still dragged to the Dark Cells, and there, subjected to all the torments that the interrogator chaplains can devise. Yet on rare occasions, a tall, cowled figure may enter the excruciation chamber and call for a temporary halt. Even with his face hidden, there can be no mistaking the awesome presence of the Primarch. At his bidding, the interrogator chaplain and any aiding in their work withdraw, leaving the hooded giant and the captive fallen alone. It is forbidden by Edict of the Inner Circle for any to know what passes between Primarch and fallen Jean-son at such times. Sometimes, after long hours, the lion emerges with an air of grim sorrow and commands the interrogators to recommence their work. On rare occasions, however, the door to the excruciation chamber slides open to reveal an empty room. None within the Dark Angels, save perhaps the very highest placed of their lords and masters, know anything of the fate of those the lion removes in this fashion. Supreme Grand Master Azrael, Ezekiel, the Grand Master of Librarians, and a handful of their peers have been made privy to certain secrets in this regard. Yet even they are left to harbor suspicions as to the veracity of what they think they know. The rationale by which the Lion chooses those he removes from the excruciation cells eludes even Azrael. More than once since his return, El Johnson has spirited away singly unrepentant and visibly corrupt beings who have admitted, even bragged of, offering their souls to the Dark Gods. What use the Primarch of the Dark Angels could have for such monsters is a mystery. Whatever the truth, though, the Lion has not otherwise interfered with the ongoing hunt for the Fallen, and has given no indication that he is dissatisfied with the methods his gene sons employ or the diligence with which they pursue their quest. Al Johnson has, on a handful of occasions, redirected the efforts of the inner circle mid-hunt, as each such instance has seen a still greater capture effected than that which was expected. However, the unforgiven take this as tacit approval from their gene sire that their hunt is just and must continue unabated. Lion L. Johnson The Lion is the Primarch of the Dark Angels, progenitor of all the Unforgiven. He was wrought by the Emperor's hand. He commanded the First Legion through the blood and thunder of the Great Crusade and the nightmarish Horus heresy that followed, only to be laid low by the one comrade he trusted beyond any other. Returned to his followers in the era Indomitus by mysterious forces, the Lion has taken up his mantle of command once again and continues to fight for loyalty, duty, and honor. Lion L. Johnson is a warrior both noble and knightly. He is as stern as he is somber, 
preferring to allow his deeds to speak for him, and driven by the conviction that loyalty is its own reward. An outsider might be forgiven for observing that the lion is as unforthcoming and clandestine as his gene sons. It is closer to the truth to say that they learned such ways from him. Even by the standards once set among the long-lost brotherhood of the Primarchs, L. Johnson is an accomplished strategist and tactician both. He has ever been an exemplary crusader against the enemies of the Emperor, a swift defender of the human race, and a stalwart foe of all servants of the Dark Guards. After his mortal wounding by Luther during the destruction of Caliban, the lion was borne away into the shadows by the strange and diminutive watchers in the dark. He was laid at rest within a chamber of the rock, so dark and deep that not even the Dark Angel's supreme Grand Masters knew of its existence. Only the arch-heretic Luther himself knew that the lion had been so interred, and that the Primarch slumbered, and in his sleep might very slowly be healing. Locked away in his own dismal cell within the rock, kept a secret through the ages by a series of supreme Grand Masters, Luther never gave up his secrets. True understanding of his own betrayal had driven the lion's former comrade irretrievably mad, Though the gifts of chaos could sustain his physical form for millennia on end, they had proven no shield for his mind. It was during the darkness of the Noctis Eterna that Luther was snatched by agents of the demon prince Marbus. By that time, he had still never revealed the truth about the lion's survival to his captors, despite claims of repentance. Yet it was not so long after Luther's emancipation the lion also found himself walking abroad in the galaxy again. Of course, as no single being possessed or likely possesses all of the parts of the shattered stained glass puzzle, none have grasped the strange contiguity of these events or pondered what it might mean. To date, the lion has no notion of who or what woke him from his millennia-long slumbers or set him upon the shadowed paths of the forest. However it came about, L. Johnson's apparent resurrection saw him return as a changed being from the one he had been before Caliban's fall. He has aged during his convalescence, insofar as such is possible for a demigod Primarch. More than this, though, any who knew L. Johnson in the days before, precious few though they are in Millennium 41, would see that he has become a more fey and unsettling presence. At times, particularly when he is lost in brooding contemplation or gripped by great anger, the shadows seem to deepen around the lion in sympathy with his mood, and even to stir restively. Those transfixed by the lion's stare have reported being gripped by an almost supernatural fear that manifested itself as a sense of being prey, lost within some dark and claustrophobic forest, while unseen and predatory things circled ever closer through the gloom. Strangest of the lion's seemingly supernatural abilities is his forest walking. Able to part the veil seemingly at will, L. Johnson steps through into an echo realm of drifting mist and ethereal, trackless forests that thrum with the spiritual resonance of the long-ago wilds of ancient Caliban. Such transit leaves odd traces in its wake. Telltale undergrowth sprouts from ferrocrete, metal, or even flesh and bone, then withers slowly into ectoplasmic nothingness over time. By walking his forest path, the lion is able to traverse vast interplanetary distance in a matter of days. On occasion, he may take others with him upon these dark paths of ever-shifting shadow, though this is a perilous undertaking for any but he. Such individuals are further sworn to absolute secrecy regarding what they witness during such supernatural journeys. These forest walks do not always bring the lion out at the destination he first sought to reach. They may lead him to journey's end only via a circuitous and quest-laden route across multiple worlds. They may not bring him to his intended objective at all. Somehow, though, they usually see the lion emerge into real space, where the need for him is greatest, 
and only his intervention can stave off the rising tides of chaos. What agency might lie behind such turns of fortune remains mysterious. Travelling either by his esoteric pathways or more conventionally aboard the voice ships of the Unforgiven, the lion roams far from the rock. Sometimes he quests to slay chaos champions and their monstrous followers, or complete mysterious tasks whose nature and purpose he keeps to himself. On other occasions, he steps from the shadows to lead one or other of his successor chapters to war in person. Wherever he prowls and to whatever end, the lion does not always choose to reveal himself, even to his own gene sons. With the aid of the Watchers in the Dark, he has proven able to escape even Space Marine's notice when he wishes it, remaining hooded and cloaked in the shadows while he observes without comment. What it is that L. Johnson watches for, or what greater hidden agenda he may pursue, his followers do not know. Certainly, he has shown no inclination to organize grand crusades in emulation of Reboot Gilliman. Still, the knowledge that at any time their Primarch may be present or could step from the darkness to lead them to glorious victory has proven a potent motivator for many amongst the unforgiven. The Primarch roused. When he casts secrecy aside and strides to war, Lionel Johnson is terrifying and inspirational in equal measure. He is a demigod unleashed, a knightly paragon, equally adroit, whether wielding the might of great armies and planet-wide confrontations, or his own personal weapons of war in duels with the most terrible of foes. In one hand, the lion wields the blade Fealty, its power field crackling as it cuts the air. Every blow Lionel Johnson strikes with this weapon lands with meteoric force and masterful precision. On the defensive, he employs it to weave an impenetrable thicket of swift parries and cunning deflections that bleed the ferocity from even the most ferocious attacker's onslaught. On his other arm, the lion bears the shield of the Emperor. Not only is this bulwark of adamantine and ceramite tough enough to stop a tank shell, but the shield also incorporates a beautifully crafted conversion fuel generator. When a blow of sufficient force strikes the shield of the Emperor, its fury is captured, transformed, and channeled back at the attacker in a furious eruption of blinding light and force. Holstered at his hip, the lion carries the armor luminous. This potent energy weapon is a pistol of such size only a Primarch's hand can wield it. Its power is sufficient to sear a glowing tunnel through an enemy battle tank or reduce a reinforced bulkhead door to molten ruin. For all his priceless war gear, it is the Lion's own indomitable will and formidable martial ability that render him truly deadly. He reads the battlefield with absolute clarity. In war, he is a predator, able to discern his foe's weakness at a glance and alert to even the most cunning attempt to outmaneuver or outflank him. He knows, equally, every strength of friend and foe alike, and is able to appraise the most complex entanglement of armies, while seeing clearly the best path to victory, no matter the odds. L. Johnson maintains two personal sanctums within the Dark Angel's colossal battle fortress, one is a grand and austere chamber of vaulted ceilings and fluttering banners in the upper levels of the rock. Stoic honor guards of robed and hooded dark angels stand watch in this echoing space whenever the Primarch is in attendance, looking on as honor guard while he receives petitions from imperial commanders and plans grand strategy on the hollow map dais, graven from a solid block of black marble that sits at its center. Fittingly for the Primarch of the Unforgiven, the lion's other lair within the rock is a secret one. Its location is known only to the highest-ranking members of the inner circle. Even they must complete the enigmatic rite of the veiled door before this inner sanctum is revealed to them, and are typically permitted entry only by L. Johnson's explicit invitation. The secret sanctum lies deep within the rock, and takes the form of a series of interlinked stone chambers where shadows creep and a thin mist crawls across the ground. Here the watchers in the dark are seen frequently, 
hastening on enigmatic errands or simply lingering half-seen amidst the gloom. The lion's private chamber is infused with a strange sense of watchfulness that even his grandmasters find unsettling. Perhaps strangest of all, its sparse furnishings and decorations are interspersed with thorned creepers and arboreal underbrush, sprouting between flagstones and winding across walls and ceilings, lending the lion's chamber the feeling of some supernatural forest grotto. It is within this sanctum, beyond the portal of penumbral sorrow and the chamber of passageways, past which, historically, only supreme grand masters have been permitted that the lion holds his true counsels. Here he meets with Azrael, Ezekiel, Belial, and others, on as close to an equal footing as ever they will be permitted. Matters of greatest and most secretive import are discussed. Things are spoken of that may alter the course of the Dark Angel's chapter, the Unforgiven, and even the Imperium of Man. On more than one occasion, even these storied veterans, knowing as they do the secrets fit to blast the souls of lesser men, emerge from these audiences pale and visibly disturbed. At times, as they have waited for audience with their Primarch, members of the inner circle have also heard the lion speaking with other visitors. These hushed conversations are unintelligible even to posthuman senses, yet something in the murmuring voices causes a frisson of unease. When they are admitted to their lord's presence, his mysterious conversational partners are nowhere to be seen. The truth is that, though he talks and strategizes often with the masters of the inner circle, Lion L. Johnson keeps his own counsel on certain secrets. The escape of Luther is one such subject. That fugitive's grim cell lies just beyond the Lion's suite of chambers, and the Primarch stands within it sometimes, eyes closed, breathing slowly, as though listening for echoes of the one who spent so many centuries clawing at its walls. What L. Johnson makes of Luther's escape, whether he wishes to seek his former mentor out, and if so, whether for final judgment or for forgiveness, he has never even told Supreme Grand Master Azrael. Certainly, the lion gives no outward sign of concern at what dark secrets either Luther or the remaining fallen may reveal. It appears that, alone amongst all those of the Dark Angel's inner circle, he does not dread censure by agents of the wider Imperium. Indeed, the lion makes no secret of his contempt for what has become of his father's realm in the millennia since the Great Crusade. He still serves the Emperor and cares for the fate of humanity. However, what hints he has so far seen of the bloated bureaucratic and deeply superstitious Imperium of Millennium 41 disgusts Lion L. Johnson. He has precious little time for the pompous and self-aggrandizing adepts who wield such power over people's lives, and even less for the ecclesiarchy and their imperial creed. Where Reboot Gilliman has shown a willingness to exploit the existing socio-administrative and political structures of the Imperium to his own ends, the Lion appears largely to ignore them. His time and respect the Primarch reserves for those who toil or fight to preserve the Emperor's realm. More than one world has a tale of the Knight of the Nihilus choosing to address soldiers in preference to brocaded governors or gilded priests. Few indeed are the officials so overblown in arrogance that they find the will or the words to gainsay a Primarch. Thus, on several occasions, the Lion's coming has led to swift and dramatic regime changes as hereditary or ineffectual leaders have been replaced by those who deal in loyal action rather than ingratiating words. The Innermost Circle The Lion occupies a unique space within the Dark Angel's chapter, and indeed the wider organization of the Unforgiven. He alone is privy to all the compartmentalized, obfuscated, and in some cases, forbidden knowledge the Dark Angels have ever possessed. He stands above even the Supreme Grand Master in seniority. All doors and vaults throughout the rock open to him. No mystery remains hidden from his sight. The Inner Circle Companions 
even within the close ranks of the Dark Angels. The inner circle companions are a mystery to all but themselves, and it is whispered, the Lion. Wielding their Calibanite greatswords, these warriors fight with sublime skill and focused fury. They act as bodyguards to heroes of the Unforgiven chapters, or at other times, pursue their own secret battlefield quests. Their presence is far from reassuring, even to their fellow Dark Angels, for Inner Circle companions arrive unlooked for and speak only via heavily encrypted Vox transmission to one another, having sworn vows of silence outside the bounds of their own fraternity. Who these Battle Brothers are, how they are chosen for their duties or why, what agendas they seek to further, these are questions asked throughout the Unforgiven, but for which no one, seemingly not even the chapter's Grand Masters, have answers. End quote. Thus we hear that the lion is trying to reclaim as many of his sons as possible. Hardly the rabid, frothing sword of wrath that I projected in that earlier video so long ago. For the lion has shown that he is not just physically older, more mature, but that this aging has almost seemed to be reflected in a far more introspective and measured soul. Taciturn and secretive the lion may still be, but now his soul seems to have matched his outer countenance, for he does not move with the bluster and sledgehammer tactics of yore. He is like an elderly statesman now, stalking his foes to take them in the dark of night in his forests. And his powers are there, for who can now chain the lion? He can walk from any trap, move through his forest realm. He can appear anywhere, strike anywhere, defeat anyone. Did he not best one of the most powerful combatants in the setting? For it is inarguable that his brother, now a demon prince, Angron, is the most lethal being in existence. Yet, using patient skill and courage, the lion bested even the Red Angel. But the lion does not head directly for terror. He does not fly to the arms of his wakened brother, Rubute. Why? Surely, he should be at the very center of the Imperium, the only other Primarch awoken. And the need for his abilities has never been more extreme. The Necrons awaken, the bugs plow towards terror itself, yet the lion seems to care not. He strikes at chaos. Is this habit, the stiff-necked inability to see the real threats? Is Lionel Johnson so mired in the past, he can only see the traitor marines and chaos as his true enemy? Or does the lion have 2020 vision? Does he strike where the need is highest, while he lets Rubute do what he always did? Empire build. He did it even during the heresy. Building, forever building. And who awoke the lion? Why? And why now? Was it his father, the Emperor? Or was it the harsh taskmaster that sees L. Johnson as a weapon? Or so the Emperor, depending on your point of view. And the Emperor's shattered mind changing like the wind, it seems. Pain. For ten thousand years. For that long, it would shatter anyone. It is an unfathomable surprise that he is lucid even for seconds. And the lion has indisputably a full legion under his command. For the Dark Angels have paid lip service to the Codex Astartes, but never truly followed it. The whole point of the document was to shatter the legions, to sow discord and distrust amongst the military commanders Yet the Dark Angels, as I said some four years ago now, are still effectively a legion. Centralized command, a perfect structure of seniority through their initiation ranks within the inner circle, permitting them seniority even amongst chapter masters. And they still harbor Archaeotech that puts them head and shoulders above their fraternal brothers, the other space marines. Perhaps my feelings in that video so long ago are becoming even semi-true. Perhaps the lion knows that he can only defeat chaos, 
by playing them at their own game. For a boot is out in the open, tied by the bureaucracy of the Imperium and constant, never-ending requests, ever as much as he would wield its forces himself. But the lion is not. None can predict the Lord of Caliban, and that could be his greatest strength. He will simply be where he needs to be, when he needs to be there, with just the right amount of forces to get the job done. And can this invisible hand behind his subtle ear be anything other than the Emperor himself? For surely, the Emperor must know, must be the one guiding L. Johnson. Unlike Rubute, whose loyalty will always be split between his father and the realm, the people of humanity. The Lion is quintessentially a most ardent and loyal son who will do whatever it takes to answer the call of his lord, the Emperor. But so much still stands to be resolved. Where is Luther? What of the mustering of the Fallen reported in the dark of space? What of Cypher? Much is yet to be revealed, so much yet unknown. What will happen when the Brother Primarchs eventually meet? Now there is a further tale to complete this entry, so don't pop off just yet. I have been Baldemort, your faithful servant. Now subscribe and like and all that stuff if you enjoyed the video, and join me every Friday as I take dives into the Warhammer universe. Or check out our other channels on natural history and mythology, links in the video description. Patron merch notification button, you know the boogaloo. Any channel only lasts as long as there are those who support it. So do take the seconds to help out your favorite creators, whomever they may be. And finally, it is February, and my lists of topics are being created. So if there are any subjects you want covered, then update me in the comments section. I don't react to everything, but I do read most of it. So have your say. Tell your faithful servant what stories you wish him to regale you with. As always, it has been not just a pleasure, but an honor to serve you. Thank you. Now, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun. Toodaloo. And now, a final story to quote. Infiltrator Brother Kohariel rose from his place of concealment amidst the ruins and opened fire at his sergeant's foxed command. His battle brothers did likewise. Sergeant Zachath and his infiltrators letting fly with their bolt carbines into the onrushing mass of tyrannids. The ruins of the Shrineplex were drowned in twilight gloom, its shadows deepened by the ceiling of lowering clouds that bellied low overhead. Purple-tinged rain, thick with spores, lashed down in sheets. Luminescent ground mist bellowed so dense and rad-saturated that it confounded even the Space Marines' auto-sensors. Amidst the obscuring conditions, the Tyranid swarm seemed to Kohariel to meld into a single, rippling organism of chitin and talons and dead black eyes. The sight would have been enough to send unaugmented soldiers fleeing in terror. Instead, Kahariel placed his shots with grim precision. His bolt shells rocketed through the murk to blow apart alien heads and dismember monsters that leapt and scuttled closer by the second. This is Portcullis, hostile contact reported Sergeant Zachath over the Strike Force's strategic voxnet. Enviro conditions adverse. Our auger scopes are confounded, but estimate main enemy strength attacking along projected vectors. What is the Alpha target? came the response from Master Lazarus. Confirmation is challenging, Zachath voxed back, even as Kohariel and his brothers kept firing. The Tyranids were a confused and undiluted mass, half hidden by rain mist and shadow. Their forerunners were driving relentlessly forward through the infiltrator's fusillade, scrambling over their own heaped dead. Weapon beasts amongst the masses returned fire and spattered the Dark Angel's positions with acidic projectiles. 
stonework and ceramide sizzled. Beside Cohariel, brother Nathan lurched back and collapsed, the faceplate of his helm a bubbling horror. Understood, Pocalus. Support nigh, replied Master Lazarus. His stony calm jarred with the rapidly escalating savagery around Cohariel. War specs flickers hinted at hundreds of Xenos bearing down on their infiltrator's position like an avalanche, bringing the promise of death with them. Cahariel ignored them. He knew his duty. Thrusters screaming, a squadron of black-hulled storm speeders tore overhead, spitting shells and rockets into the swarm. As they peeled up and away from the ruins, they ejected a cloud of crimson chem flares that lit the battlefield like a scene from a scriptural damnation. Cahariel could not restrain a grunt of shock at the scale and horror of the revealed swarm. The enemy resembled a malevolent tidal wave about to break over his position. He knew with detached certainty that he and his battle brothers would be swept away by that flood. Yet there, lumbering forward amidst the swarm, shouldering aside ancient columns and plowing through crumbling walls, were a trio of massive beasts, with sickle talons and club-like tails. Cardifexes, Kohariel thought. Screamer killers, and behind them. Alpha target confirmed, Vox Sergeant Zashath, even as the leading bioforms sprang at the infiltrators and were blasted back by point-blank bolt fire. Visual authentication of Hive Tyrant. Pocalus, fall back, came Master Lazarus's clipped response. Be Slayer, commence strike. Disengage, barked Sergeant Zachath. Tumult fire pattern. Rally point stronghold. Kohariel and his battle brothers were already breaking cover, blazing away now on full auto to cover their retreat. Tyranid bodies detonated wetly. Chitin shrapnel pinged from Zachariel's armor. He poured shots into a trio of blade-armored beasts that were trying to overwhelm Brother Beloth blasting the creatures back and allowing the infiltrator to stagger free and join the retreat. Brother Atariel was less fortunate. Three foot long talons burst through his throat and chest before he was borne to the ground and vanished beneath the swarm. The surviving infiltrators ran through the lashing rain. They leapt over rubble heaps on vaulted low walls, fighting to stay ahead of the tide of monsters gnashing at their heels. Zahariel's footsteps crunched as he dashed across a courtyard. Though through the ground mist, he couldn't see if he was treading on broken glass or scattered bone. For an instant, the traitor's thought came that Lazarus's strike would come too late, that he and his battle brother's bones would be strewn here too soon enough. He discarded the notion with disgust and kept running. The twilight erupted with furious light and sound as the main Dark Angel's force, who had waited poised and ready in their ambushing positions, opened fire en masse. The jaws of Master Lazarus's counterattack closed on the ravening Tyranid swarm as it stretched out its alien tendrils to seize the bait of Squad Zachath. Dozens of Tyranids vanished amidst the firestorm, half-seen tanks ground forward, their lumens cutting through the falling rain as the cannons blazed. Salvos of plasma and missiles flashed from fire support positions amidst the ruins. Knowing their part in the plan, Zahariel and his surviving squad mates dropped into their pre-designated spot in the line and added their fire to the barrage. The infiltrator felt vengeful satisfaction as swathes of warrior organisms were reduced to a gory mist as though they had run headlong into an industrial thresher. So sudden and cataclysmic was the reversal of fortunes that the Xenos swarm recoiled like a wounded beast on the verge of flight. Then came pounding footfalls and monstrous roars, and the three screamer killers weathered the fusillade as they hit the Dark Angel's line like living battering rams. Behind them came the Hive Tyrant, its insidious presence visibly steadying the swarm, even as its grotesque bioweapon spat barbed shards into the space marine lines. The lesser Tyranids redoubled their onslaught to push through the firestorm and hurl themselves into close quarters combat. In answer, as though materializing from the shadows, came the Lion. Failed he glowed like a beacon amidst the gloom, the Emperor's shield thrummed with power. 
A band of inner circle companions advanced in an honor guard at the Primarch's side. The very sight of him, even veiled by driving rain and phosphorescent mist, was enough to make Koharyal's twin hearts pound. He almost forgot to keep firing as he witnessed the lion charging the brood of carnifixes with fealty swinging. The Primarch caught the bow of a titanic talon against the Emperor's shield. The screamer killer that had struck him reeled back as a converted force pulse burst from the shield in an expanding shockwave of rainwater and tattered mist. Before the huge alien could rally, the lion was inside its guard with fluid swiftness. Driving fealty point first through the screamer killer's eye, El Johnson gave his blade a twist and a wrench, ripping it free. His victim toppled backwards and crashed down with eye cord jetting from its ruined face. Another of the screamer killers plowed into the midst of the inner circle companions. Its sweeping blade limbs caught one warrior and hurled him through a wall. A vomited blast of bioplasma incinerated another. Yet the Battle Brothers' sacrifices allowed their fellows to encircle the beast and take their blades to it. Bellowing, the third screamer killer rushed the lion, seeking to enfold him in a lethal embrace. The Primarch stepped back, deftly parrying with his blade and blocking with his shield, drawing the monster into the crossfire of his warriors and their armoured support. The resultant barrage annihilated the Carnifex, the lion leaping over the glowing ruin of its carcass to lunge towards his true prey. Now, for several seconds, Brother Kohariel truly did forget to fire his bolt carbine as he watched the lion and the hive tyrant duel. Blade and shield met slashing bone sword and coiling lash whip again and again. Even as the battle raged around the knight and his monstrous foe, it seemed to Kohariel as though it faded as if lost beneath the shadowed boughs of some ghostly primordial forest. The screams of beasts and the boom of gunfire sounded hollow in the infiltrator's ears. His own body felt momentarily distant, as though he were stranger watching himself fight from afar. Only the lion's duel appeared real and clear to him, lit by the whirling mists like some scene from myth. With shocking suddenness, the Primarch hacked off his foe's sidearm, and the battle leapt back into focus for Kahariel. The hive tyrant shrieked and coiled its lash whip around Lionel Johnson's neck. Kahariel cried out in horror at the sight of the Primarch's blood mingling with the rain that sluiced down his ornate chestplate, yet the lion seemed not to notice. Instead, he smashed his shield into the hive tyrant's chest, shattering kiting, pulping organs, causing the monster to reel. Spinning fealty, the lion sliced the blade through the lash whip, cutting it in two like a snapped tendon, before bringing the blade back and lopping the hive tyrant's head off. The monstrous alien stayed standing for several heartbeats, eye cord jetting from the stump of its neck. Then it crumpled, just so much butchered meat in the rain. The effect of its death upon the mauled tyrannids was electric and immediate. The impetus of their onslaught faltered, Creatures screeched and howled, snapping at their fellows or rising into the air with panicked flurries of wing beats. Kahariel's spirit soared as the lion turned back to his warriors and raised fealty high. Into them, my sons, roared the Primarch. Drive back this monstrous swarm for the Emperor! With that, the Primarch turned and, bloodied but unbowed, plunged into the wavering tyrannies. Chanting litanies of loyalty and hatred, the Dark Angels followed their gene sire into the fray, and Koharel was amongst them, bolt carbine blazing, as a lion led him and his battle brothers onwards to victory.